Every 90 seconds, someone is reported missing. Many return to their families, but for others, something has gone seriously wrong. A 31-year-old mother of three has disappeared from home. She just wouldn't have gone away without telling anybody and, and just left the children. A family is destroyed. The kids had no idea what was going on. They literally left their house with a carrier bag each of possessions. What happens in the police investigation that follows? We had a, a significant development where one of the children describes hearing very loud bang. What happens to the family at its heart? One of the most common phrases said by killers is, if I can't have you, no one can. When missing turns to murder. Natalie was very like me. She was quite loud, outspoken, quite bossy. <laughs> but in equal measure, very caring, very kind. You know, anything she could do to help you, she would. When Natalie was born, I was five years old, so I kind of told my mum to take her back to the hospital, that I didn't want her. <laughs> but as growing up, we argued like sisters do over silly little things. But as we got older, we were really close friends. And Natalie got away with all sorts because she was the youngest, all sorts. Things that we didn't get away with. Yeah, she was, um, she was a monkey. 31-year-old <laughs> Natalie is a mother of one when she meets Paul Hemming in her local supermarket. Natalie and Paul's relationship seemed to move very fast. She was only with him a few months and then she was already starting to stay at his house with her daughter. Um, within six months, she'd moved into his property with him. I first met Paul at the house that he owned in Kings Langley. It was a really odd encounter. Normally, you'd kind of greet somebody that you've been, you know, you'd say, oh, hi, nice to meet you, but he was very kind of standoffish, and he just kind of went, oh, I just need to go and get changed, and then disappeared up the stairs. From the outside looking, in, he was the full package, you know, had the good job, the nice house, the nice car, you know, good looking guy, personality, charming, you know, so he, he looked like the full, full deal sort of thing. Natalie and Paul have two children together, a son and a daughter, family life is one of extremes. Their relationship was always what I would call turbulent, Mum and Paul always seemed to, I think she was civil to him for Natalie's sake, but I think there was always something niggling in the back of Mum's head when it came to Paul. He would do odd things, like he would, he didn't attend the children's, his own children's christening. They were supposed to be getting married and he cancelled everything without telling her and she knew nothing about it. Dr Jane Monkton-Smith is a former police officer and criminologist specialising in homicide, violence and coercive control. We all try and control each other a little bit, but coercive control is different. It takes things to a whole new level and it's one person controlling nearly all the, uh, the actions or activities of the other person in the relationship. And you find yourself being controlled with your consent. So it doesn't feel in those early stages as if there's anything wrong. Paul kept promising to marry Natalie, but never did. Dangling that carrot all the time gives him an awful lot of power because if he ever feels like he's losing control, he can pull that out of the bag. He can say, let's get married, let's get married, let's do it. But if he gets married, he hasn't got that. He hasn't got that power anymore. In 2007, an argument between Natalie and Paul gets physical. It was probably only within the first six months of their relationship. He threw a mobile phone and it hit Natalie on the head. He reluctantly took her to hospital eventually, but he told her that she wasn't to tell anybody of how the injuries occurred and stuff. But eventually she did report that one to the police, but she kind of seemed to downplay it so that he wasn't 
doing anything wrong so that I don't think any of us would think that he would, was doing that. I knew there had been some reports to the police, but she was very cagey about what she told me. We know about some incidents where she was assaulted by Paul. So we know that there was violence going on in that relationship. We don't know how much because so much of it was hidden. But the control and the violence go hand in hand in this case. To be fair, I don't think uh, I ever thought Natalie and Paul were in that kind of relationship. Don't get me wrong, I did think sometimes he was a bit odd with the way that he would act, but I don't think you ever want to think that a member of your family is in a relationship. I don't think I ever really thought there was anything like that going on. Yes, there was arguments and stuff, but what relationships don't have arguments? Paul and Natalie's relationship would appear to have looked fairly normal on the outside because a lot of this control was hidden and I think Natalie hid very well how unhappy that she was. It was only up until the last kind of year in their relationship when I know that he was checking her phone a lot more and stuff. There was another incident where um, he'd thrown a bottle. The police then took Natalie and her two younger children. I think they went to mum's as well for a small period of time. But again, she went back. In 2013, Natalie flees to Yorkshire with her three children. Her sister lives in the area. I started to realise that something was very wrong when my sister moved up here. I think that was the first time that I'd spent a lot of time with her away from him, and she started to talk about things that perhaps just didn't make sense. She decided that she needed to get away from it all, but he followed her, turned up on the doorstep. To start with, it was just like he would turn up at the weekends, you know, and it would be, oh, I've just come to see the kids, and then it got like every weekend that he would turn up. He followed her up here and sort of fed her the same stories of, we'll get married, we'll move house, I'll change jobs, we'll do this, we'll do that. And she believed him, as she always does, and off she went. Joe said to her, I've done all I can do. I can't help you anymore if you go back. At the point she went back down to Milton Keynes, I was absolutely gutted because everybody had sort of moved mountains almost to get her moved up here, to get her away, to give her a fresh start. And I told her, I said at the time, if you dance with the devil, you're going to get burnt and she was adamant she was going back. What can you do? Natalie would talk to me about some of the stuff that was going on, but she would never say properly what had gone on. She was very careful about who she would talk to about certain things. I think one of, one of the things that really confuses people is why don't victims just leave? Why don't they walk out the door and just leave these people? The most dangerous time for any victim of control is when they attempt to leave. If there has been control, even just low-level pushing, shoving type of violence, and then there's a separation, the risk of homicide is raised by 900%. It's 2016, and Natalie Hemming finally decides to leave her controlling and violent partner, Paul. She had said to me that she had finally made that decision and they were over. They'd made the decision themselves because he was looking for a flat in Watford. He was trying to help her find a property for her and the children. And then the house that they had in Milton Keynes, they were going to rent. She was a completely different person. It was like this huge weight had just been lifted off of her. She was smiling, she was happy, and she was so positive. And I, I genuinely believed that she was going to leave him this time because everything was being planned. She was saying, it's completely amicable, we've both decided that we can't go on like this and we're going our separate ways. And she, was re she just seemed really focused about where she was going. I totally believed that she, she was, it was, that was it, that they were both moving on. It really just felt like it was a new chapter. 
she was starting afresh. It was a you know new story, new start, and you know she was go onwards and upwards. You know that was that was what she said to me: onwards and upwards. Thirty-one-year-old mother of three, Natalie Hemming, has decided to leave her controlling and violent partner Paul. She's forming a new relationship with a colleague. Natalie had got very close with someone at work. She said that they were just friends, you know, and he would bring her a drink or whatever. And I don't think she wanted any of us to know what was going on because obviously she didn't want Paul to know. But as far as she was concerned, she wasn't in the wrong because their relationship was over. Natalie drops her three children off at her mum's house before going on their first date. Natalie's youngest wasn't settling, so mum rung Paul to collect her. When he came, he noticed that Natalie's car was still parked in mum's street because he'd picked her up, this guy that she'd gone out with. But as far as mum was concerned that night, Natalie was going out with friends from work. She didn't know either until the next day when she came home. Um, so she just said, well, her friends have picked her up. Do you know, she's left her car here, she's going out to have a drink. The next day, Natalie returns to her mum's house to pick up her children and then goes back to the family home. Mum tried to ring that night to make sure she was OK, but there was no answer. I got a phone call from my mum on the Tuesday. She said, I can't get hold of Natalie. And I said, well, she's at work, Mum. You, you know, she'll ring you when she finishes. And she went, no, you don't understand. I haven't been able to get hold of her for two days. At which point, I just... My stomach did a somersault, and I was like, what do you mean? Because Natalie always had a phone on her. And if she if she couldn't answer it straight away, she'd ping you a quick text saying, ring you tonight, or what? But she would always respond. Natalie's mum, Margaret, is growing increasingly concerned. My cousin Simon, he'd pop round to see my mum. He goes, uh, we'll just go over and just see we'll go, we'll go to the house we'll, we'll just go check she'll be it'll be fine so they get over to the house and my sister's car was on the driveway his car was there and they were knocking on the door they could see him in the house but he wouldn't answer the door initially he kind of opened the door a little bit and wouldn't let them in um and simon just kind of pushed his way in and said i need the toilet kind of thing and had a quick scout around he get, sort of fed my mum this story that Natalie had gone away for a few days with friends and my mum sort of said, well, what, without her car? Even if she hadn't told my mum or Kerry or me, she would have told somebody where she was going and she would have asked somebody to keep an eye on the children. That, would, that was the thing for me. She just wouldn't have gone away without telling anybody and, and just left the children. It just would never have happened. Every fibre in my body was just telling me something was so wrong with the situation. I just said, Mummy, need to ring the police. The, the call was quite poignant in terms of the call to the, to the control room, and, and one of the questions that was asked of, of Natalie's mother was, was, you know, why are you so concerned? And, and you know, is there anybody in particular you're concerned about? And she was very much of the opinion that, that it had something to do with Paul. Um, so, so from quite early on, there was, a, there was concerns about his involvement in the disappearance of Natalie. One of the inquiries would, would be to ask family members when, when they last saw Natalie, where had they been, and what we did know is from Margaret Hammond is Natalie left around mid-afternoon on, on the 1st of May. Paul Hammond said she arrived home at, in the um, afternoon around 4 o'clock. He then said she left the house later that night. Police actually went round to the property to go and speak to Paul that same evening. At that point, we were all trying to ring Natalie's phone, using social media, we were all on social media. Has anybody seen, seen her, heard from her? Please get in touch. Key line of inquiry is a proof of life. And there is, you know, numbers of inquiries from, you know, mobile phones to financial to, you know, store cards, which would be um, carried out because most of us leave a footprint somewhere. And what happened, obviously, with Natalie, there was no footprint of Natalie since returning home. 
afternoon, evening on the Sunday, 1st of May. And for a mum, three children just to disappear, and certainly in the case of Natalie, a loving mother was completely out of character. A day later, the police then all did searches on mine, Joe's, and my mum's houses just to make sure Natalie hadn't gone away to be with any of us. Paul Hemming is questioned by police and asked to give an account of his movements. Paul Hemming had said that evening he went upstairs to bed at around nine, nine o'clock at night. When he spoke to officers that, that initially went to the house to, to take the, the missing person report, he was quite evasive and, and um, didn't seem to be particularly cooperative with, with the officers. It quickly becomes clear why he's not being helpful. Paul Hemming's car had, had left the home address on that Sunday evening, uh, about quarter past 10. It activated an AMPR camera in Whitchurch. Paul Hemming's car being picked up by an automatic number plate recognition camera immediately disproves his alibi that he went to bed at 9 p.m. Police act quickly. I got a phone call from Simon and he was just absolutely sobbing, saying they think he's done something to her, Joe. We've got to go and collect the children. The kids had no idea what was going on. They literally left the house because it's a crime scene. They literally left the house with a carrier bag each of possessions. That was it. A number of those pieces were put together. There was a conference in the middle of the night and a decision was made to arrest Paul Hemming. Paul was arrested on suspicion of murder and Jo rung me and she said, we need to get down there because the kids are all with mum. And I just remember Jo saying to me, but drive safely because I can't lose you too. Obviously I set a number of key lines of inquiry. You know, firstly, I'm, I'm conscious Paul Hemming is in custody and we only have so long with him in custody before we need to A, release him or B, make a decision to charge him. The challenges were huge, so we had to deal and manage the custody process. And then alongside that, we've obviously got the ongoing um, search for Natalie, trying to understand you know, you know, where, she, where she could be uh, and, and trying, to, trying to find her at the earliest opportunity. It was very quick from the moment that it was reported to the moment he was arrested. Um, obviously, my mum was distraught because she'd just been told that this guy's been arrested on suspicion of murder. You just, you can't believe what you, you're hearing. For the, um, the immediate family, family liaison officers were appointed and I appointed them probably within five minutes of getting the phone call saying that I had this investigation. And they went round and worked with Margaret and, and Natalie's other family. The, the family was so understanding, so patient. Um, they were just, you know, so lovely. And they, and they, they did have um, a little bit of hope, but they knew as the days went on, that the, and the hours ticked mm. by, they were like, something's definitely happened, something's definitely happened. But it was almost like they didn't really want to believe that. And then who does want to believe that? Mm. But for me, I think the challenge, I think for me, was the children. That was yeah. massive for me. This is a huge inquiry, lots of inquiries going on. When asked about the vehicle, he states he had not been out in the vehicle. That is effectively, you know, the key, key part of his account. It was quite clear on their, on their relationship. There was a history of domestic abuse. There was a history of his controlling behavior. So I had a number of um, hypotheses. You know, one is Natalie's gone of her own free will. One hypothesis could have been Natalie's gone of her own free will and something has happened to her by a third party unknown to her. But clearly a hypothesis was Paul had murdered Natalie and disposed of, of, of Natalie. Natalie is missing. But evidence is needed if Paul Hemming is to be charged with murder. Obviously, one of the lines of inquiry was to, to interview some of Natalie's children. All three of Natalie's children were upstairs in bed the night she disappeared. We had a, a significant development where one of the children describes hearing a very loud bang. A child goes downstairs and, and does look into the living room and describes seeing mummy wrapped in a, in a blanket and also describes seeing some sort of pan or bowl type object. None of us know exactly what he saw because he's still very close about what happened that night. He just says that he heard the loud noise, he went down 
and he saw mummy asleep on the sofa. Um, to us, obviously, we think Natalie was dead at that point, but we don't know because he just said that she was covered with a blanket and daddy was cleaning up. To me, that would say that little boy has seen his mummy dead and in years to come, he is going to realise what he's seen. Forensic evidence was found at the house. There was blood found in the living room, uh, on the floor and on the coffee table. And we have traces of blood in the boot of the S-Max. It was a significant breakthrough, but sadly it was a breakthrough that populated the hypotheses that Natalie could well have been murdered. Mother of three, Natalie Hemming, has been missing for five days. Thames Valley Police now feel they've got enough evidence against her partner, Paul, to present the case to the CPS. A lot of the work around the proof of life statement was, was significant in that, um, proving those negatives. The, the fact that there has been a, a huge change in, in Natalie's life, which helped to, to, to sway the balance in, in terms of convincing the, the, the Crown Prosecution Service that, that you know, this was a murder investigation. Um, and then on the 6th of May, he was charged with murder, with, with Natalie's murder. The police were very clear with us um, from the day that he was remanded in custody. Simon Still, who was the chief inspector on the case, he said there's been no activity on her phone or any of her bank cards, credit cards. So she's either hidden somewhere, do you know, he's put her somewhere, or she is dead and he said, I think we are looking at a bodiless murder. I said, he said, I don't think we will ever find her, do you know, because it was such a wide area that he travelled that night in that car. You know, we knew that his car had, had, had gone out on the Sunday evening at about quarter past ten, which is when it hit a, an AMPR camera in Whitchurch, which is on the outskirts of Aylesbury. We knew that it, it come back into Aylesbury at six minutes past midnight, um, and we knew the direction of travel that it, that it you know, exited Aylesbury. What we didn't know was for that in that hour and a half period where it had been. He'd dodged AMPR cameras, so some of the time he was picked up by some, and some he was on the B roads where there was no cameras, so you didn't know the exact routes he'd taken, and he was very clever in that he took one route to get there, but a different route to come home, um, so that obviously you couldn't pick up the exact place that he'd been. In terms of the search, uh, on, working on the, on the basis that, that Natalie was probably in the car, you know, in an hour and a half, you know, you can travel some distance. Um, so, so the actual search parameters were, were huge. 40 square miles are covered in the hunt for Natalie. The search involves three police forces. What was unique about this case was the fact that we were moving the search locations kind of sometimes daily. It was mainly down to the updates from CCTV um, because the CCTV team were working incredibly hard um, trying to not only find the vehicle but also um, eliminate certain routes that the vehicle could have taken having not passed a particular camera. So it kind of pushes us back into a certain direction which is why we focus the searches in, in, in those areas. Part of the search and, and trying to understand um, where, where that was like to be was we, we, we sought the advice of, of other forensic experts, um, archaeology being one of them. Um, one of the considerations was was whether whether Natalie could have been um, in a shallow grave, um, but certainly from from the expert advice that we got around the at that time in May the the, the ground was particularly hard and, and any shallow grave would have taken a significant amount of time to to dig. Um, so the, the thoughts were that, that that was unlikely. We would kept getting potential leads and mm. uh, we were all kind of on standby thinking, you know, has she been found? You're in limbo because even though we, you know, he's been arrested and at this point he's been charged and remanded, there's still that part of you that wants to believe that actually it's a mistake and that she's going to walk through the door, that it's just a, you know, it's just, the whole, the whole thing is just a joke, you know, just you just living in this, this kind of, this glimmer that actually it's all, no, it's, this can't be real. Three weeks since Natalie disappeared, Paul Hemming is still on remand, charged with her murder. I got a phone call from one of the colleagues to say that, you know, a body had been found and it was 
a strong possibility of being Natalie. He took the initial call and uh, he contacted me and I went back into the office and um, the family liaison officers, I briefed them and they went immediately to see Margaret, Natalie's mum. There was a male um, that had been mowing his field uh, on a sit-on mower and he'd come to the edge line which was near to some uh, undergrowth and then the main road and he could smell something really bad. He put his head into the hedgerow because of the, the smell that was coming from that area. Um, he thought it was likely to have been something run over by a car. Uh, and when he looked, he obviously had the green discovery. Once we knew that, you know, this was potentially something, uh, the team discovered that there was a body there which had been face down in the undergrowth and was naked. And it was paramount that we got to the family before anything else because now there was police activity, it was getting taped off, the mm. roads were being shut. One of the other, one of the other parts of it was, was around the fact that the, there was no clothes with Natalie. I think the likelihood is that, that Paul didn't want her ever to be identified. And I think the clothing would have given us that, that forensic opportunity to identify you know, who, who those remains belong to. I just remember I checked my phone um, and I had a missed call from the Flows and Kerry checked hers at the same point and we just looked at each other and just went, they found her. We just knew. It was just, just the most odd thing, just knew. You know, Natalie had, had been missing for three weeks and what we did know was, um, it was quite clear that from our search activity at that point, that was the initial deposition site. So, you know, Natalie hadn't been subsequently moved. It was quite clear that where Natalie was found was where he, he left Natalie. At that point, they were fairly confident that it was Natalie. Um, and, but obviously, they wouldn't be able to confirm 100% until sort of the uh, coroner and pathologist and all those professionals have done their jobs. Her post-mortem, there, there was injuries on her, on her, on her head and, and on her arm. What I would say, the arm one was a defensive injury, um, defending yourself as someone striking you on the, on the head. When Natalie was found, we were relieved because there's a lot of families out there that this happens to and they never get the closure that we've had. So for us to have Natalie found and she is back with us, you know, we're lucky in that respect. We were devastated, but equally knowing helps you to be able to process what's gone on. The, the way that he, that he left Natalie, um, the fact that she was naked, she was left in a place where another few weeks there might not have been anything left of her. Um, and we might not have ever found her. I've just, I just struggle with that. What he'd done to his children and to their mother and the rest of the family was huge. The impact on that was huge, and it still will be, I think. And seeing the little girl crying for her mummy, that was really distressing. You never believe anybody is capable of something like that. Never mind somebody who's sat at your dinner table and you classed as a member of your family you would never believe that they were capable of doing something so hideous. You know, the bottom line was is that he knew that their relationship was over. He knew that, that she was in another relationship. He couldn't cope with that. And the only way to, for him to cope with that was to, to not allow Natalie to have, you know, have that, that, that new life. And on the base of that, he took her life. One of the most common phrases said by killers who kill their partners is, if I can't have you, no one can. Went to trial at Luton Crown Court. On the day of his trial, he um, pleaded guilty to killing Natalie, but he claimed it was manslaughter. There was no way we were going to accept that. Um, you know, this wasn't, this wasn't a, a manslaughter, this was absolutely a murder. Uh, and, and that's what the that's what the trial was about. It was about the the intent. He claimed he threw a Fabergé egg at Natalie, not intending to cause her serious harm, and disposed of her body in a panic. We rejected that plea offer. Continued with the murder trial. I only attended one day of the trial. For me. 
I don't think I really wanted to sit and listen to the whole thing being drawn out. For me, the fact is this man's murdered my sister and I don't need to know any more than that. Paul would come in, all suited, looked really smart, you know, uh, sit there, um, all very tearful at the right mm. times towards the jury. And when they go out, he didn't care. Natalie's son was due to give evidence via video link through the Crown Court up in Yorkshire to the Crown Court in Luton. But when Paul then pleaded guilty to manslaughter on the first ever trial, he then didn't have to do that, which, to be fair, I was relieved at because I didn't want this little boy to have to go through doing that, even though, obviously, he wouldn't be able to see what was going on in the court. It's just being in that little room, being asked all these questions is not nice, especially when he was only six at the time. Um, showed no emotion whatsoever when any victim impact statements were being read of what effect it had had on his own kids um, and the effect it had had on um, Natalie's mum and her brothers and sisters. Didn't care. No emotion. During the trial, the court is shown specifically designed imagery. One of the things we did use was some um, some 3D sort of digital fly-throughs, so we can we can take the jury back to to the home address. We can physically represent what the house looks like, and we can do a virtual tour of the house, and we can show where witnesses were. So we use that that to good effect in the trial. One of the specialists that we had as part of the forensic strategy was an entomologist, um, who obviously can can date and and timeline. At larvae and, and flies, um, and when we got the report back, the I mean, this, this, the findings were incredible in terms of the timeline, um, because they were able to say that the, the incubation period of those those particular flies and maggots was about 90 to 21 days, um, which was exactly the amount of time that, that Natalie had been there. Our case was that, that Paul had murdered Natalie on the on the Sunday night, um, and then three weeks later, her body is found, which would be in absolutely in keeping with with the report from the entomologist. Paul Hemming was found guilty at Luton Crown Court unanimously by the jury of murder and burial offences and he was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 20 years. Once they'd found him guilty, yes, he mouthed, yes. didn't he, to um, the sisters in the public gallery and to the mum. Um, I loved every minute. The day of Natalie's funeral was, it was, I suppose it was, it was really stressful for me because I took responsibility for everything because my mum just couldn't. She was just, bless her, she was just falling apart. I remember that night I hardly slept and it was the most ridiculous thing because I was frightened that nobody was going to turn up and that it was just going to be us. And that's, I know it's utterly ridiculous, but I just wanted her to have the best send off that we could give her and that's oh my god <laughs> oh there yeah oh but we asked everybody to wear traditional black but we asked everybody to just wear their favorite party shoes which everybody did and i just remember when the car came around the corner there were just people everywhere and it was just like a massive relief because I just thought, you know, everybody's here for her. And then when we went inside, it was full inside as well. Natalie obviously was the baby of all of us, so to lose her, it's like losing one of your best friends. You grow up together, you do everything together, and then one day she's just gone. Do you know when Natalie's funeral, Joe went? This is the last time we'll all be together as five of us. And that, I think that for me was the bit that I just sort of said to myself, right, he's not taking anything else now. That's it, done. Paul Hemming has begun his 20 year sentence for the murder of his partner and mother of three, Natalie. Despite his conviction, his actions will have an enduring effect on all those closest to her. Our family lives have changed dramatically since it's all happened. All of our lives have just changed beyond recognition. 
Uh, I mean, for my, my brothers, it's slightly different, obviously, um, but they're still dealing with a massive loss and it's, it's had impacts on them in different ways. The impact that my mum has been horrendous. She's been very poorly. Um, her health has just gone downhill. It's just taken a real toll on her. I think she's aged a lot as well over these last years. You know, she just seems to have hit her really hard. We made the decision very quickly um, about the children because obviously my mum is not in the best of health or wasn't in the best of health anyway. So we, um, the you know, uh, us uh, four sat round and, and decided that actually the best thing to do would be for the children to come back to Yorkshire with me and Kerry. So I care for the two girls and Kerry cares for Natalie's little boy. That for us was the right the right thing to do. We've gone from having four children to having six, and it's just the most basic things like getting a car for eight people. <laughs> you can't just walk down to the local car showroom and go, "I'll have a car for eight, please." <laughs> you know, everything's sort of commercial vehicles and just yeah. I mean, God, my washing pile. It's it. You know, it's nearly as big as Mount Everest half the time, and. So that's, you know, just keeping up to date with day-to-day -day stuff is exhausting. Um, my poor husband, I don't know how, bless him, he, he's, he's coped with it all as well because obviously when he met me, it was just me, me and him and two kids and it's just kept expanding. <laughs> so yeah, no, he, it's, it's been, it's been really hard, really hard for, for everybody. Natalie's two girls are thriving. They're, they're coming along so much. Do you know, Natalie's youngest daughter never really used to talk. Now, do you know, she just talks and talks and talks and she's happy, which is all we wanted for these kids. My life has gone from being a single mum of two children to a single mum of three children. I've got Natalie's son settled in school and making sure that he has everything that he needs and that he knows that he's loved and cared for. This little boy has got so much going on up here that he just doesn't know how to vent it. It's good now because he he does believe that daddy killed mummy, do you know? To start with, he was always like, no, my daddy wouldn't do that to mummy. And do you know, he now says, my daddy killed my mummy. That man has got so much to answer for, do you know, because that poor little boy is scarred for life. In December 2015, coercive and controlling behaviour in the home became illegal. It's absolutely crucial that we raise awareness of coercive control and understand what it is, because it is so very dangerous. People can find help in many places um, these days because we're, we are more aware. Professionals are much more aware of the dangers of coercive control. The police, um, the social services, your GP. There are domestic abuse services in every town, in every area of the country. I'm now an ambassador for AFTER, which is Advocacy After Fatal Domestic Abuse. They support families through something called a domestic homicide review which is something that obviously we've had to go through. And um, they've also provided support in lots of other areas in helping me to make contact with ministers to raise other issues around the children. I'm now speaking at conferences up and down the country just to, to try and, I suppose, raise awareness of the fact that perhaps the image that people have of domestic abuse is not necessarily what it is. If I'm being totally honest, I don't think I genuinely understood what she was living with. It's only now, and having spoken to the professionals and doing the things that I'm doing now, that I really understand what domestic abuse is. I think lots of us have got an image of domestic abuse being, you know, years ago you see, you see the pictures of the battered women on hospital walls and things, and that's just not, that is just not what domestic abuse is at all. It is, that is only a very small part of it. I think I would just urge anybody who is living in a situation 
where they maybe feel threatened or unsafe, that they look for support through the correct um, agencies, charities, and if you are wanting to leave, get advice from those charities and do it safely. Because as we now know, the point at which somebody wants to leave or does leave is the point at which that, in that risk of a homicide increases massively. We don't ever want Natalie to be forgotten. We don't want her just to become another statistic. She, it did happen to her and we don't want any other children to lose their mum. So some research has shown that as many as one in four women will suffer domestic abuse across their lifetime. So this is, this is a problem. And I think it's really interesting, you know, that as a culture, we encourage young women to go out and find Mr. Right, but we never give them any help, support, or information about how to get rid of Mr. Wrong. This case centered on a vile individual who controlled women. He knew Natalie was leaving him and his control was coming to an end. Do you know, hindsight's a great thing, do you know, if we'd known what we know now, we would have done everything so differently. Do you know, she never would have gone home that night. I, I present to, to students on public service courses and uh, the Action for Youth programme is, is, is to highlight the fact that coercive control happens in, in all sorts of walks of life. It's not um, specific to a certain class of people. Um, outwardly, you'd look, at, you'd look at the Hemming family, you know, Paul and Natalie, you, you would think that this wouldn't happen in, in those cir circumstances. Well, clearly we know that's not the case. If we had truly understood what domestic abuse is and what my sister was living with, we would have done things so very differently. And I'm not saying that it wouldn't have happened because I think if somebody is determined enough, then there is always gonna be that risk. But had we realized, we would have done things very, very differently. And you just don't know what the outcome would have been.